Bill's a retired DNR uh, employee, research biologist. He began his he began in wildlife management at the University U of M. I, I guess that's Missouri. In 1958. <laughs> okay. And after the Army work and beginning a family finally graduated with a BS in 1968 and with an MS in 1971. During and after college, Bill was a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at Agassiz National Wildlife Refuge before the lake receded. Um, <laughs> from 1971 to 2001, he was DNR wildlife biologist, mainly based out of Grand Rapids and specialized on populations and research of all predator and fur bearer species, sharp-tailed grouse, rough grouse, and moose. It's a lot. After retiring in 2001, Bill consulted for a year before returning to DNR part-time for another eight years to work on piping plovers. Piping plovers? What is it, Martha? Piping. piping. Sorry. Um, put that in your pip and smoke it. <laughs> Bill re retains an intense interest in wildlife management and research in addition to Native American and settlement era history and is working on a book with the DN on DNR wildlife management history uh, going back to extinct species. Bill, with that, it's all yours. Are you done? Uh, <laughs> do you want me to be? Are you done? I, th I thank the organizers of today's workshop for, uh, for putting this on and for inviting me. It's been a really good program so far. And they, my assignment was to um, go back 50 years and, um, and talk about lessons learned. And well, I've been around a little bit longer than 50 years. And so I told them I'm going to go back a little bit farther than that. They said that was OK. I said, how about a century? And they said, no, I guess. And I'm really going to go back 400 years to a certain extent. Um, and as you might guess, as you might guess with my interest in wildlife history, I'm going to have a little bit of fun today. Digitizing all these old slides wasn't fun. Um, but, um, but, but, and I also have a disclaimer um, that the opinions expressed today are mine and perhaps not those of the management. <clears throat> Wrong way. There we go. Good grief. Now we must live on what God sends, and we're war against the bears in the meantime, for we could aim at nothing else, which was ye cause that we had no great cheers. I can say that with our comrades who were about 60, we killed about in the space of two moons and a half, a thousand moons we wanted not bear's grease to anoint ourselves, to ruin the butter. We beat it down the woods daily for to discover novelties. We killed several other beasts such as aridiacs, stags, wild cows, caribouks, follow does and bucks cots of the mountains and child of the devil which turns out to be wolverine the notes from radisson in the first white expedition to what's now minnesota in what was then canabec county somewhere east of mora absolutely incredible and it's of note that they did not kill any wolves quick outline what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about ancient and recent wildlife history policies and rules that affected wildlife populations, and really my talk kind of parallels Doug Norris as far as kind of the organization. Downers that affected wildlife, historic reintroductions and introductions, species range expansions and contractions, and why, guesses at why. Range and diversity changes the wildlife for kind, and lessons learned and not learned. You've all seen maps like this already today, but in the farmland, all the way from southern Minnesota to the north, there were bison and deer. The bison are gone. All through the transition zone, southeast and northwest, 
There were elk and deer. The elk are gone, essentially. In the far north, caribou and moose, essentially no deer. The caribou are gone, and the moose are kind of on their way out. It'd be nice if wildlife had a map like this. This is vegetation boundary maps. And back, uh, back a few years ago, the botanists drew some pretty neat maps, northern limit of tamarack and so forth. And it'd um, uh, be nice if wildlife could have maps like this, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, wildlife move a lot faster than vegetation, but vegetation also moves. Four really great books on mammals in Minnesota. The first one, 1945, by Gus Swanson, Thaddeus Suber, and T.S. Roberts, Mammals of Minnesota. It's really great. Mammals of Minnesota by Gunder, Harvey, Harvey Gunderson and Jim Beer. Jim Beer was my, mal, my mammalogy instructor, late 50s, as he was for a couple others in this room. Mammals of Minnesota, probably the best one. BSU, performer professor, Evan Hazard. And a really good one, uh, up to date somewhat, by the late Elmer Burney and Jay Knox Jr., Handbook of Mammals in the, of the North Central United States. And um, it, it's a pretty, a pretty decent, pretty decent book. But if you really want to know about what mammals and, and wildlife were uh, back before 1900, you have to get a hold of this one. Carol Henderson um, found this, this um, unpublished PhD thesis by Eva Dean Swanson. In, it was published, at, or it was a 1940 PhD thesis, unpublished, Conservation of Minnesota Wildlife. Um, 1850 to 1900, Minnesota Bookstore now has it. And if you wrote Carol Henderson or somebody a non-game, um, you might just find a free copy of it somewhere, not gonna guarantee. But if you really wanna know what it was like back then. Beneficial high points. 1891, Minnesota Game and Fish Commission was formed. 1937, the Pittman-Robertson Act that takes a few pennies out of bullets and guns and so forth and um, gives it back to the states. 1940, Eagles protected nationwide. And um, that could be under threat right now with the present administration. For 1947, the first area game managers are gonna be showing you a map of that. Of the, they were called the Dirty Dozen uh, for a lot of reasons, but, um, uh, um, but there were actually 13 or 14 of them. Uh, Save the Wetlands Act, a really special deal. 1951 celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1991. This is the big deal. Some people might not think so. 1965 bounties ended statewide. And I used to go to the state capitol in the early and mid 60s and watch charter buses drop off old trappers and they'd open the luggage compartment and drag out a couple of wolf killed deer, drag them up the steps of the capitol through the rotunda right into the conference rooms when they were pleading to keep, please keep the boundaries, the, the, the bounties. Oh, I'm gonna go back one more. Um, all raptors were protected. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it was a national or state uh, law in 72. The Endangered Species Act in 73, and the which protected wolves in 74, big deal. 1977, and Pam, was it 1977 or 80 that non-game started? I wasn't clear on that. Okay, got it right. Amazing. Okay, I'm just going to elaborate on a couple of these. Minnesota Game and Fish Laws, the commission established, I'm not kidding you on this one, established to enforce game and fish laws and to propagate the stocking of trout and carp. So Doug, that's where the damn carp came from. <laughs> Isn't that unreal? It's just unreal to me. A map of the 12 original game managers areas. Some of these boundaries still exist today. As far as now, you know, there are a lot smaller um, management areas and so forth, management zones. But, um, and I was really fortunate in my era to have known all but one of these original 12. And the stuff that I learned from them through my career was just absolutely overwhelming. The 50 year anniversary, 2001, of the Save the Wetlands Act, which is responsible for picking up most about all of the WMAs and managing them, there's some downers. It's kind of sad. You can take out your Kleenex now if you want to. Um, but the logging of Northern Minnesota Connor for forests, the Northwest Minnesota moose population crash, near extinction, the Central Minnesota prairie chicken population went, did go extinct, extinct. Norm just casually mentioned this in passing, and the loss of East Central Minnesota sharp tail range. So these are downers, and there's one or two of these things that I hope nobody forgets. First of all is logging of the Northern Minnesota conifer forest, almost a complete logging. 
each logging camp had its own hunters that, um, that worked for the camp itself. They worked very good conservationists. They shot about everything that, that crawled or moved or flew. And, but they had to keep these hungry loggers full of, uh, full of moose and caribou and elk or whatever else uh, came by. But afterwards, now with, with um, all the fire and all the logging, the basically complete logging, that really created the system, the ecosystem that we have now together today with the um, aspen and with the conifer mix that we have today. I had the privilege of doing the first moose research in northwestern Minnesota, the Agassiz uh, Wildlife uh, Refuge moose study, in which you covered a big part of northwestern, northwestern Minnesota. And then the second study in the mid to late 90s, and this is something that I hope nobody forgets about. Um, the study that was headed by, Eric, by the late Eric Cox, and, um, and a tremendous study in the Northwest, all the way from Agassiz, all over to the Red Lake Bog. And um, 1999, June 11, the plane crashed in the Red Lake Bog, killing both of these fine, fine people. And this is one of the downers that I hope never goes in the forgotten file. An incredible emotional experience and event. If you look at moose populations in the Northwest, what a, what, a, what a tremendous crash that we experienced from the late 80s into the early, 19, or the early 2000s, where the population went down from roughly 5,000, maybe 6,000, down to like 100, and then down to 50 or less today. In 15, 20 years from, think of that, 5,000 to 50. It absolutely just blows you away when you think of that. But it's kind of in the forgotten file because you talk, the media, they always talk about the moose decline in the northeastern part of the state. And really, the northwestern moose decline is kind of a thing of the past, and the media never even talks about it. It was a really incredibly important and drastic event. I call this just one degree. One or two degrees Fahrenheit can make what seemingly is good wildlife habitat into habitat that's non-habitable for the animals that live there. And I think this is really and really probably what happened in the Northwest. The study after Eric Cox was killed was taken over by Dr. Warren Ballard. And um, the conclusion from that study was that climate change really had a big impact on that moose population crash. And certainly that Northwestern moose population crash is the poster child for temperature changes in Minnesota as far as I'm concerned. Two weeks ago, NOAA put out this map and amongst all the maps that they had were the 10, the 10 counties in the U.S. that had temperature increases in the last 110 or 20 years that were greater, or equal to or greater than six degrees Fahrenheit. 10 counties in the U.S. Out of the hundreds and maybe a couple few thousand counties, there were two of them in northwestern Minnesota. Two of them in, in Minnesota, both in the northwest. And one was Rosa County and one was Kitson County. If that doesn't, just lay it right out for you. Um, so, and when, as winters get milder, um, moose ticks get far worse. And this is just ticks scraped off of one dead moose. But when, when, when you look at um, the moose in the Northeast, those of us who've been working up there on moose for many years, moose ticks really didn't get there until the, the warming of winters. Um, it's not the warming of summers that get them, it's the warming of winters because moose undergo heat stroke in temps above 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, so the moose ticks really didn't start doing their work in the Northeast until maybe the mid, mid late 80s, maybe yeah, right about then. The loss, the total extinction of that East Central prairie chicken population. This population goes back, first of all, it's in the Four Corners area where Cass and Crow Wing and Hubbard and Wadena counties all come together. A small area, it was uh, started and managed by the Crex Carpet Company of Grantsburg, Wisconsin to cut sedge to make rugs. And this is how Carlos Avery got its start, this is how Crex Meadows in Wisconsin got its start. And so that little area in the east central part of the state had a population of prairie chickens dating back to at least those 1850s. And it started to dwindle kind of in the 60s and 70s a little bit. And then the mid 70s, the huge Bedora fire came along and opened up that country. And as Norm said, there were a lot of prairie chickens that came along after that fire. Unfortunately, that fire caused the death of one person. 
So this Cass County Land Department did some really landmark jobs of, of putting out observation blinds for prairie chickens. There are one or two um, state prairie chicken society meetings there. And, uh, but gradually as that country grew up, uh, succession took its toll and the population was no longer manageable. What's really sad to me is there wasn't a single conservation volunteer article, there wasn't a single news report or anything. We let a whole population of prairie chickens just drop off the face of the earth. And it's really, to me, it's really sad. I call it the last sunrise at Bedora. East Central Sharp Tails, you know that I can't get away with talking about East Central Minnesota Sharp Tails, which occupies a huge area from Kitson County all the way down to Pine and Canabec counties in a lot of disjunct habitat complexes. And these complexes are getting smaller and smaller as time goes on and they're losing their landscape character. And uh, it's really a sad thing to watch. Most of the wildlife managers, in fact, all of them that I talked to in the last couple, three weeks, I asked them, how much has your, are the number of, how much have the number of leks gone down? And they all said uh, about one out of four, one out of five that they counted uh, 20 or 30 years ago remains today. So this is a tremendous, a, a tremendous problem, a tremendous successional problem, a tremendous management problem. It makes you wonder if there really is any hope at all. But there is. And if we start managing for landscapes, pick a few areas that we can manage for landscapes, um, pick a few areas that we can manage with partnerships. And this is an example in Northern Aiken County, just south of Palisade, the Gun Lake State Wildlife Area, um, managed and purchased and managed by um, by Pheasants Forever, Turkeys, M MDHA, Sharp Deal Society, and a number of individuals, um, Soil and Water Conservation Districts. So there's, a, there's hope, you know. We're probably, I guess maybe in five years, we might not even be able to hunt these birds anymore, but I hope that they don't go the way of the Bedora prairie chickens. Have kind of fun with this, uh, the historic introductions. One was an accident, one was an accident marked by one red asterisk. One was an almost, marked by two red asterisks. 1930, elk and woodland caribou in the Northwest. I'll elaborate on just a couple of three of these. 1950, chucker partridge in the North. Some of this stuff isn't even written down anymore. It's just like old files that I inherited from DNR and so forth. Mid 50s, Fisher at Itasca State Park. 1960s, black grouse and capercaillie put into Minnesota. This absolutely just blows you away, you know. And um, 1980s, a feather in Carol Henderson's cap, otter at Lac a nice article in the Volunteer a couple issues ago. Early 80s, raccoon dog game farm escapes. Ed is here, you can maybe talk about it more after I'm done with it. Um, mid 80s, Sichuan pheasants almost ended up in Minnesota. That was, uh, that was I'm not gonna show you a slide on that, but it was put out, was really being pushed by the state of Michigan who were getting into it. They wanted, they wanted Wisconsin to get into it. They still had their game farm facilities. They almost did it. Then they wanted Minnesota to do it. We backed out of it and didn't want anything to do with it. And North Dakota really came close to buying into this. And so DNR, our own DNR and our own Prairie Chicken Society and Sharp Tailed Grouse Society um, convinced North Dakota to not do it. And a little while later after North Dakota backed out, I talked with a Michigan Upland game biologist who says, Bill, we wanted another state to do it with us because we didn't want to fail by ourselves. And in the last few decades, a huge, smart, good-eating omnivore has invaded North Central and Northern Minnesota. Just show you a couple slides of this. In the bog areas north of Upper Red Lake, early 30s, woodland caribou were put in. Brought in, I think it was from Saskatchewan. Gretchen can tell you a lot more about that. And both she and I have given talks on this. Um, that's John Manweiler, uh, who was with the Resettlement Administration and the CCC that were responsible for doing this. And that failed, the woodland caribou failed, probably at the same time the homesteaders were moving out and at the same time deer were moving in because woodland caribou are really susceptible to brainworm. Upland, game, upland areas north of Upper Red Lake, elk were put in and they were being raised in a, in a, in a nursery farm at Itasca State Park. And um, um, they were ferried up to, to the Red Lake bog country, but on the upland part of the bog, that's really important. And that population almost was too successful. And I know some old homesteaders who were up there who talked about herds of elk, 50 and 100, chasing these kids on the way home from, from school, country schools. And um, so when the, 
when the homesteads grew up, the elk didn't like that habitat anymore, and so they went farther west over in that Greg Legatsky country, where they still are today, but no longer a herd of two or three hundred, most likely in maybe three dozen animals that DNR has let remain there. The farmers didn't like them very well. 1950s, um, fisher were put in, I think they came from Ontario, um, uh, put in Atasca State Park. That totally failed, but a couple decades later, fisher totally repopulated northern Minnesota on their own, probably due to some fairly um, maturing timber after the large logging eras. Black grouse, northwest of Bidette, um, and Capper Cayleys at Scenic State Park by Big Four. And they were flown over um, in, uh, well, of course, old DC-4s, DC-6s. Um, they brought over a couple dozen of each. These files are incredibly hard to find, and one of the reasons is because I retired, I took them with. Um, <laughs> because, I was, because, I was afraid, because I was afraid that somebody who took my place, they'd probably end up throwing them. It's really important history. So about two dozen of each species, uh, the mortality was pretty high on the way uh, over from Norway and Sweden and Denmark, pretty high on the way over to northern Minnesota. And then uh, one of the mistakes that was also being made was um, uh, hanging one or one pound or one and a half pound transmitters on three or four pound birds. And, and so the Capricales didn't last long at Big Fork, but uh, black grouse lasted until 1971 or 72 in the reintroduction area um, north of, northwest of Bedet. And I, I knew one Swedish grouse biologist, I had really had many of them, Gordy Gullion and I had many visiting. Um, and we were by the upper Red Lake bog area and he said, you know, Bill, he says, if, if you had put uh, them black grouse in the Red Lake bog, they probably would have made it instead of putting them up northwest of Bedet. So um, they, it's possible that we made, you know, whoever, whoever decided made the, made the mistake. Um, Carol Henderson has one of his first feathers in his non-game program cap, um, stocking otter in the local parlor area. 22 otters went in there between um, 81 and 82. And um, very few people know of this introduction, tremendously successful. And of course, you all know that otters have toilet sites, and this is a toilet site in, um, a toilet site in Carol Henderson's bathroom. But we kept a lot of these otters at, at, um, at our house, and then we tr would truck them down. And um, my kids almost lost a, couple, lost a couple of fingers by feeding the minnows. And, and, and then I flew two of them down one day uh, in a little Cessna 150. This is back when you can get away with this kind of stuff and not going through a conservation pilot and approval. You just did it, you know? And, and um, had, put, had two otters in the back seat of the, of the airplane, little 150. And they took off and they were making all kinds of noise and then they were quiet for the hour and a half trip. I thought, crap, they died, you know. And so I, so I landed the plane short on the runway. I didn't even want to go see Carol Henderson who was waiting for me in the truck at the other end of the one. I thought they were dead. I delivered two dead otters. And they were both laying on their backs in their cages eating walleye heads, Smi smiling. In the early 80s, um, there were some game farm operators, fur farm operators, that got clued into Asian raccoon dogs. This is, kind of looks like a half raccoon, like a half dog, and it's a member of the canid family. Extremely prolific, valuable fur, and uh, so unbeknown to us, um, game, some fur farms in the central part of the state uh, started raising these. And, uh, and they're pretty smart, like a raccoon, and they're pretty hard to keep, and, and um, they started escaping. And so give a lot of credit to Ed Bogus and Section of Wildlife, and some money was scrounged up in DNR, and I'm not sure, maybe the maybe de Department of Ag. And, and Ed went around and methodically bought out the game farms, and all of the raccoon dogs were killed, and, uh, which is a really good thing, because this was a real potential nuisance animal to, to create its own niche. And Samson, uh, holding one of these dogs, these are pretty good size, you know? 12, 13, up to 20 pounds. You can see where this one was, had been caught in a snare by a trapper. And we probably wouldn't even have known about this for a long time if trappers hadn't have, start, hadn't have started to, to, to catch them. So that's the almost. And one was that, that was too successful is this one. Um, the strange um, omnivore um, was put in kind of willy. Remember, I, I'm not taking responsibility for a lot of the stuff I say. But this was put in kind of willy-nilly, haphazardly, 
all over north central Minnesota without any little study at all what they might do to the environment, what kind of niche they might carve um, in the environment. If they're going to be, who knows, par parasitic on, you know, gauss this or whatever, they were just put there. And now they're there forever. And um, that was one that was probably too successful in my opinion. Species expand their ranges because they're adaptable to changing conditions. And examples are gray fox and possum. And they contract their ranges or they recede northward or if they're in the mountainous country, they go up the mountain until there's no more mountain top to climb um, because they can't adapt. And examples are certainly wolverine and Canada lynx and woodland caribou. And this little diminutive guy called the snowshoe here. And I'm gonna talk about that for a second too. So I call them natural range expansions. These are, you know, the climate change really isn't natural, but these, a lot of these species like the possum, like the coon, like the gray fox, cottontail, have certainly expanded the range northward because of changing climate conditions. And this little guy, when I had mammalogy from Dr. Beer in 58 or 59, he says, yeah, they're possums in the Minnesota-Iowa border. Um, they're not gonna get any farther north. Their feet will freeze off and their egg, and their legs will freeze off, their, their feet will freeze off, their tails will freeze off, and their, their ears just freeze off like right away. They're gonna die right away. Well, uh, we learned a thing or two from that. Dr. Beer was probably wrong once in his life and that was it. Um, because in 85, they got north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. He said they would never cross the Mississippi River or Minnesota wow. River. And um, so in 85, they got north of the Twin Cities. Uh, by 98, they were in a line across from Duluth to Fargo. And now they're in a line somewhere just uh, around two harbors all the way up to Grand Forks. And still probably heading north, you know. Um, really adaptable critter. When you look at the, oh, there's a, there's a lot, there are a lot of bobcats in northern Minnesota that never thought they'd eat possum for supper. Um, and then when you look at the jaws at the mandibles of a possum, it's like little saw blades, a really adaptable little scavenger and predator that's probably a really efficient uh, ground nesting uh, and even maybe tree nesting uh, bird species. Just going to mention the raccoon, how far north they've got. By 1920, they were in Ontario and southern Manitoba. 85, they were in a line, at least in Manitoba, across uh, northern, the north end of Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba. By 1998, I had, I had a camper friend um, that we were camping up at Reed Lake in northern Manitoba, said, we've got some animals in our garden that have striped tails. And are they raccoons? And they're raccoons in Flin Flon, Manitoba. And in 99, we were in, uh, Terry and I were in Churchill. And, and raccoons were, and striped skunks were in Churchill, Manitoba on wow. Hudson Bay. So a couple of these species have gone north because of climate change, but simply warmer conditions. And the, the, the little cottontail rabbit, every northern Minnesota city has cottontails now, and you hear more and more stories about cottontails in the woods. Gray fox, far, far many more of them in northern Minnesota, um, possibly aided by some riparian um, guidelines as far as logging goes, which permitted older trees to be left along uh, flowages and so forth. The Fisher and Martin, incredible range expansions, you know, Dan talked about Fisher and Martin out on the prairies. Um, we had our first Fisher season in 77. Imagine two month season with a limit of three, and in three years we trapped them out basically. And together, in addition to an incredible amount of uh, illegal activity that I was part of uh, going on to mobility with enforcement and catching the bad guys. Um, but so, and then first trapping season in 85 for Martin. And now we've got really cautious trapping seasons that are pretty highly regulated and, and pretty short seasons. But that range expansion from Fisher and Martin, I had people in North Dakota saying they had Minnesota Fisher and Martin in, in Fargo and Grand Forks country. I can't when I retired, I promised myself I'd never talk about wolves again for, for obvious reasons, the late 90s thing. Well, I've broken that promise twice, but this isn't really the same kind of talk. Um, but this is a, a map from early 70s, Minnesota wolf range. Most of the wolves, roughly five, 700 of them lived up in the red area. Once the Endangered Species Act kicked in, there were a few wolves that lived in that speckled area maybe six or eight or 10 packs. And we had a couple, three or four of them radioed, which is pretty neat in the Hill City area and Chippewa Forest. Um, and then, but the Endangered Species Act 
in combination with Boney's ending in 65, really had an impact on increasing wolf populations. And so now we have roughly 2,500 living in that entire area, all the way from the red through the speckled into the blue. And we have wolf populations that are up around 2,500 now. First survey in the late 70s, uh, 1235, late 80s, and you know, all 15, 1700, and now it fluctuates right around 2,500. And I want you to think about one thing because when Radisson talked about all these critters that he shot and killed and ate in, um, in Canabec County, he never mentioned wolves. And one thing to think about is in pre-settlement times, bison and caribou and moose and elk all support wolves in far, far lower densities than, than do deer. Deer support wolves in the incredibly high maximum densities possible. And uh, so it's very possible that today we have as many wolves or probably more in just the northern Minnesota wolf range that we have than pre-settlement time that we had during, uh, dur during that time. Got to talk about this little guy, snowshoe hares, and people don't think about that stuff very often. All of the old mammalogy books that I show you show that the, the bottom line, roughly 1950 snowshoe hare range, you know, down from the Twin Cities over to that Lacoparle country maybe, you know. Before I retired, I, I inquired with all the, all the wildlife managers who were then on that southern edge of the snowshoe hare range, and they didn't have any more. They're, they're gone. And uh, so now the snowshoe hare range the southern range extends all the way down around Pine County, Canabec, and towards up that Fargo-Moorhead country. And, and that, you know, people just don't, here's this little, little prey species that provides a lot of food for a lot of different critters, you know. And, um, and it really was a, neat, was a neat time. I knew people that were alive that were born around 1900s who talked about, you know, eating snowshoe hares for subsistence. Um, but they never had seen anything like that 1980s, late 70s, 80s snowshoe hare peak. And it was really great to be a dad with three little boys um, during that time. And my, my three kids and um, myself and Dave Keene and a couple others, some work would go out and get 30 or 40 or 50 snowshoe hares out of young Blandon plantations in the afternoon. And, uh, and a pound and a quarter, we're biologists, we have to weigh this stuff. We're um, a pound and a quarter to a pound and a half of boned out snowshoe hare meat per hare, which gave us enough, as much meat in the freezer as a, a good sized doe. And other species that are receding northward, we don't think about that. The wolverine went way before the caribou, then the caribou went, and there used to be spruce grouse in the Namaji country in Pine County into Canabec, um, spruce grouse in, in northern Aiken County, spruce grouse and Itasca State Park. Well, those are totally gone. And now maybe you're lucky to find, even find one in the north end of the Chippewa Forest. And they're all kind of hovering up in the far northwest, north, far northern part of, of um, Lake of the Woods and, and Cooch and, um, and the northern border country. And the same thing goes for Canada lynx. They're gradually for going farther north. This is, a, this is kind of a part of the program I almost deleted a day ago. Game school pictures. Those of you in Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service and County Land Departments, well, DNR always used to have an annual game school. Now it's called Wildlife School. It's no longer annual. But this is a picture uh, back in the late 50s. A um, handful of these guys are still alive, believe it or not. But it, if you notice, it's incredibly, it's a totally male-dominated thing back then, you guys. Um, 1981. Notice everybody had long heads back then. It might have, I'm not sure why that is, but oblong heads. Um, but if you notice, there's, 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 there's a couple, three gals in that picture. There's, and I think the non-game gals were probably in there at that time. We started to see a little bit of diversity showing up in section of wildlife and eco-services. And then we get the last game school picture I have. Is, this is 1988. The year doesn't show on that slide, but 1988. And probably uh, one out of three females, and I think that's really great. And as I look out of the audience today, probably 50-50 mix, and I think that's just terrific, you guys. And so I went to the latest wildlife uh, management area map, and roughly maybe 40% uh, 
of the managers and assistant managers and regional wildlife staff are females. And I think that's just wonderful. And then the other part of this is, I look out at the audience, great diversity, great gender diversity. But it's really a lot of white faces out there. And this is kind of hard to talk about, but um, it's something we have to face. Half of Minnesota population is non-white. And yet we have a lot of white faces trying to teach Minnesotans maybe how to be out the door, be out of doors and try hunting and try trapping and try fishing and try bird watching. So that's a challenge. Lessons learned. Dan did such a beautiful job on lessons learned and Doug did a good job on it. Boy, I laid awake nights. What the heck can I put down for lessons learned? The first lesson that I think we learned is watch what we propagate, especially carp. <laughs> and the second one is that some species are especially prone to overharvest. Like, I think, like the fisher and like the martin, you know, and maybe in the black bear category as well. We have to just be more, more cautious there. Lessons being learned. And this is not to say that we're not, we haven't learned a lot of lessons. I just couldn't think of them, but boy, I really had a hard time with this. Lessons being learned. Don't legislate, natu don't legislate natural resources decisions. And the Minnesota Wolf, Re Wolf Management Plan is a really good, really good example. DNR Wildlife set the state record for public input attendance statewide. We had 12, or Mike Don Carlos and I hosted 12 or 13 meetings across the state. Uh, roughly 3,000 people attended. Um, and we had the round tables, of which Ed was a part of, and um, it really took, our, took a toll on us. And Mike Don Carlos stayed a, a premature life, probably due to that stress. And then we gave it to the legislature, and they changed it around. After, in the last hour of the last day of the Wolf Roundtables team, people finally consented because we had to have consensus, 100% of the people who were at the round tables had to consent to it. And so um, um, don't legislate these kind of things. <clears throat> Another one was keep industry from influencing natural resources decisions. And a, an example is the current him, timber harvest goal conflicts, especially, especially on wildlife management areas. And I know this is gonna come up in the afternoon discussion. And um, other things that we can, that we're still being learned is establish more working partnerships with groups. And I think the Prairie Chicken Society and Sharp to Grow Society have really been great examples, um, thanks to leadership of people like Jody Provost and, and just tremendous examples of working partnerships that really do work. And another one is improving communications. And I think we're really going a long ways there as far as improving communications. But these are all lessons to be learned. And a lesson yet to be learned is diversity and diversity and diversity. I have just reflections that I'm going to just talk about real quickly. At the end of the, at the, end of, um, the 20th century, Tom Dixon from DNR Information and Education asked then Fish and Wildlife Director, now deceased, Roger Holmes, to recap the last 20 years, in other words, 1980 to 2000. And Holmes said, in the last 20 years, things have improved with many of the programs initiated by this department are responsible for these improvements. There had been, had been, a steady erosion in the ability of the department to carry out these programs it's responsible for. And then Dixon, he's also left the department, but still does some artwork for the volunteer. Then Dixon asked a field person his prediction for the 21st century. And that field person said, as to the 21st century, we must continue and expand so that the condition of our natural resources is not just status quo, but better, much better. And that's a challenge considering increased population development and technology. And I read on the next line, next line and I'd totally forgotten that that field person was me. And that's the end, thank you.
if anybody has any questions. Yeah, go ahead. I'm twist. This damn thing, I'm twisted up. <laughs> Kathleen, go ahead. <laughs> Kathleen was my coyote student, so she still loves coyotes. Yeah, great. it's a great, great question on coyotes, and I could have mentioned that. As I have this slide, I didn't show it, but wolves and coyotes don't get along, and coyotes and fox don't get along. And so when the, most of northern Minnesota, except for the northeast part, had all wolves, the rest of northern Minnesota was full of coyotes, as you well know. And, and you could have answered this question. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But, but anyhow, so, so, um, so yeah, it was full of coyotes. And then with the wolf moving in and basically filling in all of northern Minnesota now, Coyotes are few and far between. There's still coyotes there. There's still coyotes hanging around airports and hanging around farms and sheep farms and everything. There's still coyotes there. But um, pretty much gone. And now there's a lot of coyotes. Most of the coyotes are in the southern part of the state, southwestern part of the state. Not that the wolves chase, you know, the wolves don't chase coyotes out and they run away. They, they kill them. They eat them. They, and the coyotes avoid those, site, those areas. So with the coyote gone out of northern Minnesota, and you have the wolves, and the wolves could care less about that scrawny little red fox or gray fox out there. And, and so that explains a lot of the increase for a fox in northern Minnesota, and increases kind of the predator base, um, possibly, you know, and might play into the whole rough grouse upland game bird equation. You know, woodcock and rough grouse and sharp tails and everything else. There's more ground nesting predators out there, including the red and gray fox, including including, you know, possums and well, well. Yeah, good question. I'm glad you asked it. Dan. Really, it was Brian Stenquist and I who came out, you know, came up with that stuff together. Yeah, we just noticed these subtle little changes, you know, um, subtle little range changes that happen, and um, you know that eventually in enveloped into the DNR's climate policy or guidelines or whatever it is. Um, yeah, but just these little subtle little changes, you know, um, kind of with a possum, you know. Geez, the possum could doesn't give a darn if his ears freeze off and his tail freezes off. You know, he's still that possum. Still, his his her young in the spring has has twelve or fourteen babies in the late summer. You know, and just think of the population dynamics. And it's not very seldom you drive across Highway Two from Floodwood to Grand Rapids and you see a possum. You know, in Floodwood, and. So just those subtle little changes, I think, kind of triggered all that. Pretty neat, pretty unfortunate, pretty sad. 